Yeah. Okay. So my book review is a, like, it's a very fascinating book that provides like an excellent introduction to the complex world of cognitive neuroscience. The book is titled as Cognitive Neuroscience, a very short introduction. And it is written by Richard Passigam. I would say that this is very informative book, which can provide us the overview of the key concepts and theories in the field of neuroscience. So introduction about author. He is a highly respected scholar and renowned for his com uh, contributions in the neuroscience. He graduated from uh, like uh, undergrad from BA in University of Oxford. Then he did his PhD in University of London and later he uh, joined uh, back the University of Ox Oxford as a lecturer. And uh, the fields of study he's best known for is neuroscience, cognition, functional magnetic reso resonance imaging. And he he's like the first to study human cognition using fMRI. So this will be the outline of the presentation that I will be starting with the difference in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, then uh, what is the brain and mind and how we deal with it, then followed by uh, some of the concepts in cognitive neuroscience. So uh, psychology is the scientific study of the mind and behavior, but actually there are different perspectives to psychology. And the earliest human psychology can be traced back to 400 to 500 BC. And cognitive psychology and neuroscience, both of these fields are a part of psychology in it. And it comes under like five pillars of psychology. Cognitive psychology is concerned with mental processes like perception, thinking, learning, memory, and what we do predict and control behavior. On the other hand, neuroscience, it's a branch of life science, which basically deals with biology of nerves, neurons, neurons tissue, and how we behave and learn. So these are two dis different aspects in uh, psychology. Now, of course, there is a difference between the mind and the brain. While these terms are being used interchangeably, but they actually refer to different aspects of uh, our cognitive functioning. So the mind is the ability to think, feel, experience emotions, remember things, and engage in physical activities. Uh, and it's like an extra, abstract concept that is often described as a software that runs on the brain's hardware. Brain is a physical organ which is inside our head and support these mental functions. It can be uh, thought like we, we can consider it as a hardware of our own body which can run the software like the mind and uh, brain is basically made up of like billion of neurons. So uh, the idea of uh, left brain and right brain like the author explained it very uh, briefly in the book because all the studies are being based on the brain functioning. So uh, it, he refers that there is a popular notion that each hemisphere of the brain is specialized for different functions. Left hemisphere is often associated with uh, analytical and logical thinking, language processing or mathematical abilities while the right hemisphere is often associated with creativity, in, intuition, and emotions. So there is an important note that the idea of left brain or right brain has been somehow oversimplified. And it is true that certain functions are heavily re represented by one hemisphere, but the brain, like the brain is, uh, the whole brain is interconnected organ and which can perform complex cognitive uh, processes and requires both of the hemisphere. It's not, it's not just, uh, it depends on the one hemisphere. So this book, okay. So author explained that language processing is often uh, thought as of the left hemisphere, but research has been shown that right hemisphere also plays an important uh, aspects in the language. And similarly, the right hemisphere is associated with creativity, but left hemisphere also contributes to creative thinking by helping to generate new ideas. 
Now, uh, this book is based on mainly the studies in human brain. So let's see what is inside the human brain. The brain is composed of billions of uh, neurons, which are responsible for transmitting information throughout the brain and the nervous system. Neurons come in like many different shapes, sizes, but they all have same basic structure that uh, this a cell body and dendrites and an axon. So in the last book review, Ranjit explained in his book that how neurons fires. So I'm not going to explain that part, but I just want to add on that, that neurons communicate with one another through a process called synaptic transmission. When an action potential reaches the end of the axon, like here, and then it triggers a chemical messenger into the synapses, which, uh, which will receive at the end of these uh, dendrites. So uh, this book is being divided into chapters of cognitive neuroscience and the second chapter describes like what is the per perception in neuroscience. So perception is a fundamental aspect that involves like how the brain process information from the environment, like sense, how we sense our vision, hearing, touching anything or tasting or smelling. So perception involves several st stages of processing in the brain starting with the detection of sensory features such as color, shape, or texture. So uh, like when you touch anything, so it's it's like uh, our brain automatically categorizes that it, it is a familiar object and it activates a ne network of brain regions which is involved in object recognition and memory. Uh, so this chapter answers like these three main questions like, do you need to recognize an object to know how to handle it? So the answer is no, it is not always necessary to recognize an object to how to handle it. For example, if you handed an unfamiliar object when eyes are closed, you can still use your senses to touch and to see, to determine its uh, shape, weight or texture to figure out what you are holding it. And the next question, like several series of several series of experiments uh, show that why do some amputees still feel their arm when it is absent? So this phenomena is uh, rises from the changes in the brain sensory uh, that following that there that is not following that there is an amputation. Brain continues to receive input from the area where the limb is used to be. And this can create an illusion that there is a limb, but uh, the brain is trying to make sense of the missing limb that will like generate a sensory feedback and will be normally associated with some movements or touch. Now, uh, there is often that some people can see colors when they read or hear. So this is called a cross model sensory exp uh, experiences in which like, uh, in one sensor modality can trigger a perception in another modality. For example, uh, you are hearing something, but you see also a color. Like uh, most of most of us can uh, relate to when we are into a into an environment where there is very high DJ noise or like sound noise. So we are able to see some colors over there. So this is called cross model sensory. So uh, this color synthesis uh, may be experiences with certain sounds or being associated with certain uh, with specific colors. Uh, the information in the brain processes is associated with the connectivity of these brain regions, like how uh, this, these brain regions can identify these modalities differently. So that's the reason why people can see some of the colors while they hear something. Uh, so one, the next. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is very interesting. This cross uh, model sensor. I remember there's a there's a cyborg in UK who is the color blind guy. Can't see color, but somebody put some you know some kind of you know organ here, which is has an antenna here or something of that sort. So he kind of you know perceived color by you know sound, and uh, so there's a tape talk where you know you know tape talk on this. So how how people you know studied this cross modal sensory in uh, 
uh, cognitive science or neuroscience. So, how, how it is so in the book author explained that they are using fmri uh, for these things like they are, they are like, creating uh, they are creating a virtual environment with these uh, what do you call this the specs which people put on and they are creating vr technology so they are putting vr technology for creating a uh, environment of a disco for example now uh, people can see certain colors at that time if they are changing certain sounds then they put them into fmri also to see that how the brain changes according to certain sounds when they are with headphones so that's how they are studying these and com coming to the conclusion that uh, sensory modality uh, can trigger the perception of another modality Uh, so the next chapter in the series is of attention. Perception is al always influenced by attention, which directs the brain's limited resources to specific stimuli or features in the environment. Now, uh, we, we know that, that certain information which is processed is uh, followed by a complex cognitive process. And we have to ignore irrelevant information that is not necessary for the certain specific task. So people have different capacity and uh, how to process these information. And often it is being seen that attention declines as we age. So attention can be again like divided into subtypes, sustained attention, selective attention, divided attention. And uh, I will give you an example on this. Like for example, we are trying to find our keys and our desk is completely cluttered. So we might be selected to uh, attend those visual features of the keys while ignoring the other irrelevant ir ir information. Like if you have a keychain in your key, you will try to remember that, that keychain information and uh, you will able to find into your cluttered desk. So uh, in neuroscience, attention is thought to be involved several brain regions and that can uh, that can conclude to uh, forming neural networks this uh, this can work together to control the attentional proce processes and shift attention on different objects and maintain attention on uh, some important objects over the time um, now uh, these are the research studies which author explained that why do some patients neglect things to their left brain after a stroke. So uh, when, people, when people have a stroke that damages brain regions and if it is involving the attention. So uh, in the brain, there is a partial, like parietal cortex in, into the right hemisphere, or you can say it is, it, it is affecting the right hemisphere of the brain. So this can result into the lack of certain objects, people, or events on the left side, as we seen in the earlier slides that uh, left only represent right space and vice, vice versa. So lesion in right result in no remaining space to the right, right side, so to the left side. Now, uh, this, this can happen like patients may fail to dress one side of their body, eat food on one side, or they just eating the half plate of their side and reading just one side of the page. So these are the studies which are being explained. Now, uh, the next is like, why do people attend something else and it decreases their feeling of pain? So author says that pain is being subjective experience and it can be influenced by various factors. Uh, when we attend a task which involves certain stimulus, that requires more attention. So our attention will be focused on that stimulus rather than our, uh, using our sensory region in the brain. This is because our brain have certain, re uh, like resources are limited and attending to one stimulus may reduce the attention available for processing other stimulus. So that is how uh, brain shifts its attention. Uh, now, uh, 
the last question is that we have often listened from our parents also that it is dangerous to use a mobile phone while driving but have you think that why so the processing of different sensory streams occur in different areas when we attend a secondary task such as reading or sending a text message we will be less cog we will be less cognitive like the resources available to devote to driving are being shifted to using the mobile phone which requires visual auditory and cognitive resource now if you are uh, like responding to some conversation and replying a message or you are you are just leaving less attention for the task of driving so research has shown that attention is a limited resource and it's better to not uh, divide it between two tasks which can lead to uh, decreased performance on both tasks so be mindful if you are using mobile next time when you drive now you know like don't use on mobile phones uh, so the next chapter is memory so we know that memory is an incredible tool that allows us to accumulate vast amount of knowledge and experience throughout our lives from learning the name of thousand of people and things like uh, mastering complex things like playing violin or playing chess doing programming our memory plays vital role in shaping who we are and how we navigate the world around us but have you struggled to remember someone's name or forget in where you parked your car so despite our ability to learn and remember a vast amount of information throughout our lives our memory is far from perfect <clears throat> so in neuroscience uh, memory is studied at the cellular level like cellular circuit level uh, which can which can understand the mechanism what we are doing and what is the learning process now uh, we don't have to store the memory into the single place uh, like if you consider an computer and there are like uh, bits and bytes uh, saved at several places into the fragments that's how our memory works also so it just not store at single place but instead it stores into the fragments and memory performance involves like the cooperation of multiple brain systems working together and to uh, like help us to learn and retain new information uh, while using our prior knowledge what we have so uh, here author suggests that by understanding how these system work together we can better appreciate the complexity of our memory processes and we can come up with new ai technologies and like how to store and retrieve information better whatever available in there into the uh, domain of ai so uh, next chapter is remembering uh, remembering is the process of recalling information stored in the brain from past experiences now memories are formed when the connection between neurons in the brain are uh, like repeated over the time and stimulating these connection have a neural pathway and become uh, efficient with the practice which can uh, allow us to recall information easily over the time now the process of remembering is not always perfect i would say as memories can fade away over the time so uh, these fragments in our mind uh, might be faded away also so researchers are continuing uh, studying the complex me mechanism like first how memory formed and then remembering like how the brain is able to retrieve uh, to better understand how we remember and how we can improve our ability to recall information uh, so there were certain experiments on memory yes no no okay. so there were certain experiments for uh, memory or oh, sorry remembering like how people uh, from amnesia from the past can retain their knowledge learned at the school so it depends on the episodic memories uh, we had a discussion on episodic memory if you remember when ranjit presented his book so uh, hippocampus is critical for retrieval of episodic memories 
and these are like personal memories of event from our life so at a certain contents if the event is occurring then there is a prompt recall like prompt like we give to chat gpt that kind of prompt only we can say that like if you are going into a room you just recall that you were here before and where you kept your keys so that kind of uh, uh, memory is called prompt recall and that will give us our episodic memories so system uh, anatomically separate like separate it's from uh, the possible possibility of the stroke after after stroke also people can uh, able to remember these episodic memories uh now like if uh, there are like uh, problem with the old age people that they often uh, forget names so this is this is not because they are uh, arbitrary like they have many visual and semantic features they they are attached to only one person but it's like uh it's been confused in this way because they learned over the time a lot of things with their age which can uh, made them distract like who was that person so that's why sometimes uh, it is been seen in the research that they forget name it's not it's not just dementia or something but just the experience or the learning of people which tends them to forget people name and the last research which i found interested is like why do people with alzheimer's disease have difficulty in finding their way so alzheimer's is like a progressive neuro uh, neurodegenerative disorder that can affect several of the cognitive function and which includes also like how we navigate our way so over here hippocampus is the uh, location in the person like in the brain which is responsible for the navigation so if a person is finding the route uh, or or uh, they want to go from from office to home or of uh, from home to office so they even forgot because that uh, navigation sensor in the hippocampus is been uh, affect by the alzheimer's disease so there is a loss of tissue in hippocampus that will result in having trouble in retrieving the episodic memories so patients often fail to know like where they are and where they have been to the next comes is the reasoning so reasoning is a uh, is like a logical thinking of past experiences and knowledge that come to a conclusion or solutions to the problems so it involves the ability to understand the com com complex uh, information and make uh, the decision which are being based on certain information so over here author explains that there are specific brain regions like including prefrontal cortex which plays a like uh, important role in higher order thinking and decision making so he explains certain studies in which uh, there are been uh, factors where people uh, studied age education and like cognitive training like people go to certain schools learn something and here uh, researchers have tried to understand how the brain process reasoning and how the these people who are been uh, went to certain special schools how they come up with like new strategies to improve decision making and problem solving skills <clears throat> so next is decision so it is the choice between like if you have two or more alternatives and you have to decide like what to do often people get confused like what is a better choice with that like it that a person will go with a a or a b choice so decision making involves several brain regions uh including perception attention memory emotion and reasoning all the concepts which we had learned till yet so decision is based on all these things so again the prefrontal cortex in our brain region plays a very important role in decision making and integrating information from other brain regions which can uh, which can guide to which can guide us to based on certain 
conditions and certain information to reach a current goal or like to reach a current goal of decision making uh now uh these questions i found very interesting like why do uh, we are absent mind like why do we make absent minded mistakes so like our prefrontal cortex is in a unique position in the brain which can uh, process the information on the current needs and aims and access to the motor system like how we move and how we take steps and all these things so so the action for like for the appropriate uh, thing like on the environment it is based on the situation which repeats over the time and if it is repeating again and again you become habitual about taking an action like if you want to make a coffee at a certain time so you will go from your desk to the coffee machine you will make that coffee so it is being habitual over the time but uh, but research shows that there is a penalty of doing that situation and this habitual action uh, can can be uh, go off often because if the situation changes let's say uh, you you know in the morning that your coffee beans are finished but what if you have a habit of coffee at the 1 pm you will wake up from your desk you go to the kitchen and you will try to find out the coffee beans but in the morning you know that your coffee coffee beans are finished so we say that we are absent minded now uh, why do we choose immediate rewards rather than long term rewards that are larger so we are able to plan in our mind and we can imagine certain potential like outcomes what will be the outcome of that thing so this ability also depends on the prefrontal cortex but this uh, future outcome is like less clear in our mind like but the immediate one will be very clear like what will be the reward of after doing this like immediate rewards so uh, people don't go that far uh, and Uh, people don't go that far to think about what will be the future outcome that we will get from the for if we stay like if we be patient but they will do the immediate ones because that is more fascinating to them and the last question was that the what is the uh, basis for moral reasoning so there is like a quote quoted that do as you would be done by depends on the ability to intuit what it is like for others to be affected by our actions so uh, the same area is engaged uh, when we imagine our potential outcomes for ourselves and also we think about what others would feel in a similar situation so uh this doesn't justify the principle but it <coughs> sorry but it does make it possible for us to uh, think on a moral reasoning okay hold on go back uh go back. Yeah. okay uh so the next chapter explains us about confirmation or we can say checking so confirmation is is like a bias which people tend to search and remember information in certain way that can confirm their beliefs and their attitudes on certain situations now this can also uh, this can also lead us to make errors in our decision making because our because of the biasness which our mind is limited with the exploration like if we don't want to explore certain other other alternative approaches so um, like our voluntary reactions are dependent on certain things and now this voluntary reaction uh, in in the neuroscience it's it's like a very debated topic that some argue that our actions are predetermined by our activity in the brain while some people suggest that it's the consciousness and the self awareness which can give us ability to make choices 
which are not being determined by neural activity. So the this this I find very debatable, and in the senses like uh, our action is considered free, uh, is still a matter of like philosophical and scientific inquiry. So I was not very clear about it, like how people did the research in it. Uh, but the next question was like, how can we learn from our mistakes when we perform tasks when they, they are difficult? So learning from mistake is often studied in the context of reinforcement learning. When we perform a task, our brain makes prediction about the outcome of our actions and compare these predictions with the actual outcome. So if there is a like, if there is a mismatch uh, between the predicted and the actual outcome, the brain adjusts its predictions for the next time we perform the task. And when a task is difficult, the brain may need more feedback from the errors to adjust its predictions efficient, efficiently. Let me give you an example that uh, when you are cooking something and you go near to the stove and the gas, like sometimes it, it happened by our mistake that we just touch the hot, uh, hot pan or something like that. So next time we will be careful about like to not touch the hot pan when the gas is on. So this is how our brain will be uh, adjusting itself uh, for the next time we perform the task. Uh, now, uh, how we are able to infer the intention of others. So I would say that we are not only aware of our mental states, but we have also the ability to infer the mental states of others. So that comes with uh, emotional quotient. When we observe the action of someone else, we automatically simulate that action and ca that can uh, able, to, able to understand the intention of others. But we can also able to apply those, those into our past experiences. And we will try to look up our knowledge to reflect on like, what likely they will be thinking in that situation. So that, that comes under the conformation part of our brain. So next thing is acting. So- Hey, Deepa, I need to complete in about five minutes. We want to have both, uh, you know, yeah, the, presentations. I have three more slides, I will be done. Okay, so acting is a complex process which involves like multiple brain regions. Now our uh, motor brain is uh, depend on both consciousness and the unconscious process. For example, we have to move consciously from left to right, but what if we have to pick up a cup that will come with like automatically in our movement. So uh, in the neuroscience, motor behavior is like a studied in variety of contexts, like uh, in the Parkinson disease, so in the Parkinson, Parkinson disease, researchers can develop new treatments and intervention to improve like the motor functioning and their movements in the disorders. Uh, just the, the, the last two questions which author discusses like why we are able to uh, learn like the complex task of playing a violin. So playing a, a violin is like allowing us to form the new neural connections and like make strong existing connections. So with the practice and repetition, brain can develop necessary uh, motor skills, uh, which can perform complex uh, movements and sequences. And why can't we tickle ourselves? So uh, the inability to tickle ourselves is the phenomena called sensory attunation, in which the brain, uh, brain suppresses some of the sensory input and results into self-generated movement. So that's why we are not able to tickle ourselves. Uh, the last chapters concludes on the future. Like we have a very, very progressive understanding and working of the brain, but there is still much more to learn by, ex like by exploring alternative methods such as MEG, single neurons or electrode arrays, which can be uh, which can help us to reveal the mysteries of the brain. Additionally, uh, he discussed about the advanced computational models such as Blue Brain Project, 
uh, blue brain project is a more comprehensive understanding of brain function based on uh, a mouse like mouse model mathematical model and then he uh, discussed that he is looking forward the future like ai technology and gives examples of deep mind and alpha go which shows great potential in the ability to analyze uh, analyze and learn from the complex data set with continued research and innovation and last year, like as i want to conclude here it it was clear that we have a significant process, progress in understanding the brain, but we still have to learn about it, uh, capacity, capacity for learning, uh, artificial neural network and the error correcting algorithms, uh, which are being based on human learning have been uh, show a successful, like successful uh, AI algorithms, which we can assume that brain have also figured out like how to achieve the same results. Even though we are still uncertain about the exact mechanism, but with research and innovation, we can continue to look into the mysteries of brain and improve the understanding like how we learn and process information. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I want to bring up uh, two, three issues here. Um... So one is, a uh, uh, while ago, I read a book, uh, which I was extremely impressed with. The uh, name of the book is A Telltale Brain. This guy, uh, 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 S. Ramachandran uh, at UCSD, is a very celebrated author and neuroscientist. And he is the one credited with these original experiments of phantom, uh, phantom uh, limbs. And, uh, you know, the Deepa brought up earlier uh, issues of that. So original uh, experimentation of that. Um, uh, was done by this guy, to my knowledge. Uh, what was very impressive is how he thought about the experiments uh, that could, um, you know, uh, prove or disprove certain, uh, you know, hypothesis or theory. Uh, so uh, not just the finding, but um, devising the experiments to uh, cover the finding and how he did that. Uh, that 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 was the most interesting takeaway for me. Um, and uh, so if, you, if these line of thing are interesting, this is well worth it. I had bought a copy of the book. I think you should have it somewhere, you know, in your library. The um, uh, second is, um, I wanted, uh, my interest has been here, is there something that we can learn from neuroscience and cognitive science, their theory and their hypothesis, which we can reduce to a computational form. So if anybody, um, you know, has such an idea, such a thought as to, we are, you know, reading something, learning something uh, 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 that we are not seen implemented in uh, computer science, uh, in AI algorithms, uh, uh, then let's talk about it. I would love to hear from you. You go, you get the credit for thinking about it and, and but there's something to think about. You know, you today, you saw the mention of reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, He's uh, saying that uh, that explains the way brain works also. Uh, so, well, okay. Um, uh, something where we can align, uh, particularly if there is a new innovation in neuroscience that can inform, we can't recreate the brain in computer, I guess. You can, we can argue about it, but uh, generally that is understood. But uh, how can we uh, do something that is analogous at some level? Uh, that will be very interesting. Uh, and finally, I'm just interested in hearing from each of you very quickly while the next person is set up. Um, I have a, have a, a question. Uh, uh, the, I wanted to um, uh, uh, hear from you very quickly. What did you learn from this talk? Uh, or, 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 and also whether um, these things that you heard, uh, which are relatively standard for the area per se, and this was a small book covering other things, um, were there, in your case, these are new things or you were aware of it? Like how, what percentage of this thing you are aware of it? And what is one or two things that you can really, um, you know, take away from that? Akashik? For this particular talk, <clears throat> actually uh, just last semester was it? Uh, we did a class with Christian. Mm. So uh, some of the technical aspects of what Deepa just talked about, a lot of it I'd heard there. Mm -hmm. uh, other than the connection,
connections to computational science like uh, reinforcement learning and ethics. Uh, I, I once again I've uh, seen those connections being made before, but I I I, I have my own uh, thoughts on the matter from reading not this one but other material on it. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit today. So okay. Uh, Ushin. Okay. So, uh, I think to introduce topics, maybe we could talk about the different Okay. Okay. Uh, so, the, on one particular slide that I liked about it, and I could bring up an analogy, is uh, uh, how our brain works to, to, to devise motor sensory skills in terms of repetition mm. that she talked about. And uh, on the on our other side, uh, uh, when we process data, it's almost repetition of the data itself, right? So uh, the two analogies that I derived for myself and in terms of machine learning is if you, what I thought is, uh, in order to be good at something, you'll have to repeat it, and that's how the machine or us learn, or we as a person learn. So that I want to know more about it. And the thing that I found missing in the first uh, hours, uh, computer. that's a lot, but, uh, but yeah, something of that sort. And one thing that I found missing on the first slide is uh, she talked a lot about uh, brain anatomy and, uh, and how it's, how it works upon different parts of work, brain work of, to do different kind of things, but there was no single diagram of it brain anatomy itself. So that's what I found missing. If you go to, um, if you think about the world's best musician, yeah. do you know how much repetition they do? How much? Yes, uh, more uh, than 10,000 hours. Yeah, a lot more, right? Yes. And uh, the other thing is uh, they they really learn at a very early age. Yeah. The ones that you, there are always exceptions. There yes. are always exceptions, uh, very rare. But otherwise, you look at, um, Kaushiki Chakrabarti, it's uh, today's best female uh, classical singer, or take anyone, you know, uh, look at Hari Haran and look at their life stories, and you'll find that they got started really early and continue to, you know, learn from multiple days, people, this and this. That's the people who reach the pinnacle. Uh, there are many good people, and they can do this, but when you really want to get to the pinnacle, that seems to be a uh, a pattern that you see. Um, but uh, Dr. Shet, to bring one more point to this, I heard of a TikTok where a TED talk was. I heard of a TED talk where <laughs> 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 they mentioned the concept of 10,000 hours and how you can learn some new uh, activity, which is which you do not want to spend 10,000 hours on. So yeah, yeah, but, but uh, you, have to, you, you have to then say, is it? Um, the activity like uh, you know art and music, uh, and and reaching that level of perfection, <laughs> it is it is one thing to be very good, and it is another thing to you know reach the level of the example cycle, right? Yes. Yeah. These new these TikToks even I have I've heard some of these yeah. like these are like hacks or bear ups. Uh, I like hacks personally. <laughs> <laughs> If you actually want to learn a skill and maintain it for the rest of your life, there is uh, no other way than the repetitive um, exercise that happens in your brain. So just to add to that a little bit, the uh, kind of skills that we are talking about, at least is my thoughts on it. Uh, uh, you're doing this by repetition so many times, I think to train something like muscle memory. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do uh, fast reasoning uh, over something that is not that precise, like minute moments of muscle. I don't think you need them to That's why human generalize faster to newer unseen things. But if you want perfection of music playing, muscle memory at very fine grade motor control, probably repetition is the way to go. That's to Regarding generalization, I don't think that is the case. Humans do not always generalize, not every human generalizes as well. If I play chess for 10,000 hours, there is very less probability that I'll play Go as well at that competency in let's say less time so generalization is not very diverse there also has been another thing is like if you're going down you're going down like 10,000 hours for it if you're going for that you're doing it last time i would not do that 
Yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so if I hadn't read the last book, which I, I, some of it would have been new, but then I, one thing I found interesting was that the last, the book that I reviewed uh, kind of tried to make what you were saying, to try to give an analogy uh, from human brain to computational. Okay. Brains. But this was not giving that, it was more like a general idea. Okay. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Uh, so I agree with Ranjit, but on top of that, at least the scientific facts that were presented as well as uh, But also there were a lot of facts that were put to challenge in the past couple of years, like cerebral balance. So she told how if the left brain is affected, the right space of it is void and you cannot do or perform those actions. But I think that has been solved and there has been a lot of study how cerebral palsy can be cured with a lot of various methods. So there are a lot of other scientific facts, but keeping that apart, this is something that I did not understand how the concepts from cognitive science actually relate to a computer scientist. That, yeah, that this book is not on that. Yeah. This book is not on that. And, and, uh, that would be, it would be interesting to hear, hopefully, well, some of your talks will have it, or otherwise we should have a separate discussion. It's good to have the grounding here, but uh, uh, our, of course, you know, bigger value is to uh, see a new, new, new um, uh, inspiration for, you know, Something you know, computing. See, the point is that uh, uh, should you guys make a discovery of some kind, or you know, you know, come up with a new algorithm, and you guys are able to explain this is inspired by this thing happening in human brain or neuroscience, it uh, is on a solid footing at some level. Uh, uh, you know, um, you can explain it well. You can people will accept it more easily. Um, that. Um, you can explain it that way or, or reason it that way, uh, you'll get a lot more attention. Right? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be that way, but I think that would be valuable. So, anyway. Okay, let's let Dadi explain the uh, very interesting and uh, somewhere new to me. And also, uh, I would like to uh, know uh, which part of the brain uh, are responsible for which human actions. And also, if I have not mistaken, uh, she uh, didn't talk about how sleep and memory are related. Yeah, this is a short book. Yeah. 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 Uh, there could have been some, yeah, how the memory is retained mm -hmm. while with sleep and with age. Sure, sure. This, is, this book is, uh, you know, short thing yeah. and not covers everything, but that's fine. I think that's right. Uh, so I'm reading a book, a relative sleep brain. Huh? And the relative the relativistic brain okay and that is more on the side where they're connecting Fantastic. the ai computational models with then we'll hear from you more yeah so i uh what the, con the like different concepts about the like uh, brain functions uh and like all the information that uh, we have somewhere in the mind but uh, so this is the, the refreshment the, uh, the different information and uh, the, uh, the other part is like what brain anatomy is like associated with different uh, mm -hmm. uh, these concepts but uh, like i don't uh, uh, relate uh, like how these concepts are like associated with the company so as, as we shall yeah. mention and, and we that's what we want to do what you want to say so uh, one thing that we try just during the presentation was the cross-modal sensory activation Hmm. And um, if, if it's possible, I would probably want to read more about as to how that exactly happens. That yes. Second, um, in terms of the content, I believe uh, most of it was very familiar. I mean, of course, I don't have in-depth knowledge because I've not personally read it, but it, I was very familiar with almost all of the concepts due to uh, Dr. Shalin's class, class and the discussions subsequently. Um, third thing is, Every time I think of uh, uh, building a computational model to mimic brain activity, I always have this constant reminder that even though an airplane is adapted from a, the way a bird flies, but it still does not flap its wings. So um, th that is where I hit a roadblock. Like we cannot exactly mimic the human activity and trying to do so would probably lead to catastrophic failures. How then can we adapt a computational model to be inspired from the human brain, but not exactly mimicking? This is made a very good point. Uh, that's absolutely good. So, you know, uh, uh, what I wanted to simply add here is that, look, um, uh, 
first of all, all of you come from different, um, uh, you know, background. So uh, somebody like Yushin, who has uh, done neuroscience, uh, in fact, has a degree in that. Obviously, I didn't expect her to learn much more from here. But somebody like, uh, you know, somebody who's come straight from computer science or you know engineering and then computer science and has not had these kind of things there will be something novel. the other thing though is that i am of the belief that um these uh you know uh, you know largely uh you know the exceptions but uh, uh you know deepa and uh, you know yushin and deepa both have done some of these things before uh, but otherwise largely we all come from computer science background and uh, the exposure, earlier exposure to other fields, uh, it's not just the major neuroscience or uh, can be very, very valuable, especially when you're going to become a researcher. If these are, may not be as valuable if you're going to become an engineer and developer, uh, but if you're going to, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, you have to get things from the left field, it's called, right? Get, get ideas really um, that are uh, unique, that is what, I am hoping and I'm hoping to encourage you to, I don't have a, a you know, a easy recipe for you to say, this is how you become innovator. But I would like you to, you know, always ask, how can I really think um, uh, differently, uh, you know, uh, than others. And uh, very often you do that by going to other disciplines, whether it's this or that or that. So that is something, uh, you know, for a, Training of a researcher, I think, is very important. That's why we are doing what I'm doing. Hopefully, uh, I have an interesting question. Hmm. Uh, I hope you probably don't have the answer, but let me just put it so that you can think about it for everybody. So there's an interesting movie by uh, Scarlett Johnson. What's the name? Uh, Lucy. Lucy. Right. So the movie based on the hypothesis is human can't use 100 percent of their brain. So this is not an idea that will be developed. I have seen similar idea in various Hollywood movies. So basically, it's a Western philosophy, a colloquial idea. Somebody talked about it, and it's remained. So I read the you know uh, assertions that human uh, you must use only ten percent of the brain. Yeah. Like that. That's, yeah. And that will be uh, now question. Right. So 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 that's the question to quality scientists and neuroscientists: whether this is being proven, not proven. Did anybody try to prove it? You know, experiment it. So how how you know how is it? Debatable. It's debatable. Mm -hmm. When you say ten percent, ten percent of what? Of their capacity. I mean, we have we have established that you use more than ten percent of your brain. Thoroughly established that. So I think the question was, you know, how are we establishing percent of the brain that's being used? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, no, uh, my question is, how do you evaluate uh, brain capacity? Like, if you say that we are using 10% of human brain uh, of our capacity, then how, how do you measure what 100% is that? So a lot of the sort of neural imaging methods and stuff, and I think some of that might be where some of this misconception comes from, because you'll see these, um, you know, prints where like maybe a large section of the brain is grayed out, um, right? And if you're sort of not accustomed to how that imaging works, you may be tempted to conclude that, you know, oh, we're only using this part of the brain. Um, but really, those are sort of um, like superimposed um, graphics. Hello? So, Savannah, can you just hold up? Um, yeah, so these are. 
Here's what I found. Okay. Can you speak now, Savannah? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think part of where this sort of 10% misconception comes from is, um, you know, if you've maybe you've seen some of these fMRI papers where you'll see like graphics where a large section of the brain might be grayed out. And uh, the convention for like notating these types of things is you're presenting, um, you know, that graphic is a superimposed um, graphic. And so basically what those are showing is we're showing the difference in brain activation between you know two different states or two different tasks, et cetera. And so the gray parts are all the areas that are sort of roughly similar activation between two tasks. Um, and so you know I think there's just sort of a lot of misconception about the methods there. Um, and you know I guess generally when people say the 10% they're looking at your I guess the assumption is that it's you know like 10% of the like uh actual like volume of your brain or something like that um and that's yeah that's fairly like if you look at sort of any of these different fMRI or other types of um analyses it's fairly immediately obvious that you know name a task and people are using more than 10% of their brain to do that. Um, in general, you're not for these types of analyses, like percent of brain activated is sort of not even a dependent variable. Um, so you might see some stuff where they talked about, you know, increased activation in a particular area. Um, but in general, people are not sort of using this percent of brain activated as a dependent variable for generally any type of um, neuroimaging analysis. So I would say that this 10% brain uses it's a myth. And I covered that thing in my uh, Spike book review that um, if I remember correctly, there was a normal brain and then Alzheimer's brain. Uh, in which like certain cells are activated in the normal brain and normal brain, like normal human be being can use all of the brain parts, but it's just that some of the regions in the brain are being less uh, using and that other re region, like if you are doing a critical thinking part, that will be like more highlighted in the fMRI. So it depends on certain tasks, like which task you are doing at what time, but it's just not like it's using 10% of the brain. That's a myth. And it's also debatable topic, very debatable. I have to share some other material. Okay, all right, guys, move on. Okay, do we have enough time? Uh, Thank you. Janendra, you can.